As the fighting rages on between Israel and Hamas into its fourth month, Fox News is getting a first-hand look at the Israeli operation to clear out Hamas's tunnel system beneath Gaza. Fox News correspondent Trey Yinks joined Israeli forces and has more. That's right, it's day 107 of the war between Israel and Hamas. We did join Israeli forces as fighting rages on in the southern part of the Strip, and Israel uncovers new evidence about where hostages were located. An Israeli gunner scans the windows of a building in Han Yunus as troops move toward the front lines of the Gaza Strip. In the heart of a civilian neighborhood, Israeli tanks maneuver through the dirt with firefights in the distance. You can hear there, Israeli forces are battling Hamas militants just blocks away. In the basement of a nearby home, the entrance to what can only be described as hell below earth. So we're going down now 20 meters underneath the ground, down to the tunnel, down to the prison. This is where they took the hostages when they lead them to the prison. Dark and sweltering corridors are illuminated by torchlights and headlamps. Crouched but advancing, we move carefully through the labyrinth of tunnels. Right now we're deep under Gaza's second largest city of Han Yunus. Israeli forces behind me remain on high alert. They've not yet been able to clear this maze of tunnels. In a large room, we find pots and pans. Alongside baby diapers are the tubes Hamas used to store rocket-propelled grenades. Further into the complex, small cells with iron doors match the description of where released hostages say they were held. We found here hair. We found here children's drawings. We found here DNA. This is verified to be a hostage cell, a hostage compound. Back above ground, amid the sounds of war, we get a closer look at Han Yunus. Recent analysis says around 50% of all buildings in Gaza have been damaged or destroyed. Countless vulnerable Palestinians left without homes or shelter. And as the war moves further south, Gazan civilians are running out of places to go. This is why in the north we called the population more, almost three weeks before we entered into the area to move to a safer zone because at least that we, there will be less casualties but, but Israel has targeted that zone as well. Of course, because in the north there was a huge tunnel system. Amid a growing humanitarian crisis for Palestinian civilians, Israeli forces are expected to lower the intensity of their campaign in the coming weeks. In Tel Aviv, Trey Yinkst, Fox News. Thank you to Trey Yanks for that report. I would like to welcome into the conversation now our friend here, Dr. Alon Bushstein, a visiting assistant professor at UC Irvine, also an Israeli Institute fellow. Alon, always a pleasure to have you here. I was watching you as you were watching that last report. I'd just like to get some of your thoughts because looking at those tunnels, we're talking about a very sophisticated, almost underground city beneath Gaza in which Hamas has operated from. First of all, thank you for having me. Always nice to see you. Um, yes, the reports from the tunnels are pretty horrific as you start to see them. Hamas, according to the latest estimates, has built a network of between 600 and 750 kilometers of tunnels. That is, I mean, I do kilometers, not miles usually, but you know, I'll say about 400 miles or 500 miles or something like that underneath Gaza City and the Gaza Strip. Now, these tunnels were used for two different purposes. One is attack tunnels. So these are tunnels that Hamas had prepared in order to prepare itself for attacks as the IDF invaded. And these have been used to carry out ambushes against different IDF operations and also in order to sort of store weaponry. The different types of tunnels are these bigger tunnels. That's what we saw in the video earlier. And these are tunnels that were used either as command centers, and some of these still are functional command centers, or places, as we saw, that they hid and locked away hostages. So as the IDF is uncovering more and more of these tunnels, we're sort of getting an understanding of how sophisticated and how much time, effort, and money Hamas has put into developing this, what's called the metro, underneath the Gaza Strip. What we saw now is in Hanunis. The IDF is still clearing these tunnel networks in Gaza City. Gaza City is in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. The IDF has been operating there already well over two months. It has operational control already six weeks, eight weeks of Gaza City. And yet, there's this entire, as you said, almost city underneath 
from which Hamas can not only continue to operate, within it, it has booby traps, it has weapon storages, it has food warehouses, it has all it needs for its survival. That's one of the reasons that Hamas is able to continue to survive is this very, very impressive and expansive tunnel array. Okay, but we are getting a better idea of this entire system there. You see that the IDF has a pretty much identified, I mean, again, though, you're talking about 400 miles of tunnels, so that seems really extreme. But given where we started on October 7th, how much progress has been made in this war now that we're getting a better idea of how Hamas is operating? Well, that's really the big question right now, because... The United States is mounting extreme pressure on Israel to come up with its day after plan, its strategy, which basically is a question of where is the war going? What are you doing? And in Israel, there are more and more reports coming out that the war, despite its successes, and it's had a lot of successes, is not going as fast as planned. Yesterday, there was a report that, according to the IDF strategy, by the end of December, it was supposed to have full operational control of the cities of Hanunis and Rafah in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. Well, Hanunis is what we're seeing on the video right now, that the ongoing fighting is going. The IDF has not touched Rafah yet. So that means it is going slower than expected. Hamas also, as has been proven to us time and again, is a smart organization. It refined its tactics. The IDF surprised it very much with its invasion plan. The IDF invaded not in the way Hamas had anticipated. It's one of the reasons that the IDF was able to take over the north relatively quickly. But Hamas adapted. It's adapted now, instead of engaging the IDF in face-to-face -face combat, it is using much more of these guerrilla tactics. It's using much more ambush tactics every day. We're seeing IDF soldiers still in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip that are being ambushed. And one of the very disturbing reports that came out in the last couple of days is that as the IDF is pulling out of different regions in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, specifically Gaza City and Zaytun areas and Sajaia, what we're seeing on the ground is that Hamas is starting to reemerge. Hamas police officers are starting to come out of hiding. Hamas different providers of social services are starting to come out and actually regain some control of the territory. This is coming under a lot of criticism in Israel specifically. There was a letter sent today by over 130 senior officers who had participated in the fighting in the Gaza Strip, calling upon the government saying, what is the strategy? Because the IDF has achieved successes in the war, in the North, but without any strategy, without any what's called day after plan, without the idea of, okay, and now what is going to be the governing mechanism in the Northern parts of the Gaza Strip? If the IDF pulls out, Hamas is simply gonna take over again. What are we doing? The lack of strategy, is coming in collision with the successes of the IDF. So really, on the one hand, we do see success. The IDF may be progressing slower than it had intended, but certainly successful in taking over the northern parts of the Gaza Strip and in its activity also in parts of the southern part of the Gaza Strip on the one hand. On the other hand, the lack of an effective strategy, the lack of foresight, how is this translated into something that will not allow Hamas to just regain control is something that is coming under heavy criticism in Israel, seemingly also in the world. Seemingly, that's one of the reasons the United States and EU are starting to heavily pressure Prime Minister Netanyahu saying, so what is your plan? Let's say you succeeded. Hamas is destroyed. Now what? How do you stop this from happening again? At least publicly, there is no plan. Maybe no plan yet, but Netanyahu earlier this week making headlines with the comments saying that he rejects the idea Palestinian statehood post-war, also saying that the IDF has to have complete control of that entire region in order to protect Israel itself. So was this on his mind all along to kind of redirect how this war has been going to officially have control of that entire region? We know that the state of Palestine and Israel, they've been in pretty much a head-to-head -head match when it comes to their territories. So... The history of the Gaza Strip and in general, the Israeli occupation and the Palestinian territories is, is very complicated. But essentially, Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip in 2005. And then when Hamas took over in 2007, Israel and Egypt imposed the siege of the Gaza Strip. And then in the West Bank, which is a different territory, the territory is divided. It still has almost entirely a security control of Israel, but there are pockets, somewhat, some 40%, that have some control of the Palestinian Authority. What Prime Minister Netanyahu said is that Israel will maintain security control from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, or anything west of the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, which essentially is the entire area of Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Maintaining security control, I think he was very careful with his words, because he did not say 
therefore there will be no Palestinian state. He said this collides with the idea of Palestinian sovereignty. This collides with the idea of a full-fledged Palestinian state. But seemingly, part of his conversations with President Biden have been maybe some sort of Palestinian state that is demilitarized, and that therefore Israel will have complete security control. But what is important to recognize is that those plans are right now very, very vague. The idea that Israel will maintain complete security control is all well and good as far as Netanyahu is concerned. But at the same time, Netanyahu has himself said that Israel will not have civilian control on the ground. Well, then what's going to happen to the you know, upwards of 2 million people in the Gaza Strip, 85% of whom are currently internally displaced, hunger, diseases? Who is going to provide those social services? There's the UN. Israel has also said it does not want UNRWA, the main UN agency that runs the Palestinians, to be a main player there. Who is going to run that? There are different ideas. In Israel, there's been the idea of a multinational Arab force. There's been the idea of some sort of combined administration of Egypt and maybe the United States. But the plans aren't on the ground. Again, this does not mean that there are not going to be plans. This does not mean that maybe there are plans that haven't been published. But what we're seeing is that, meanwhile, as the war goes on, the lack of implementing an effective strategy is starting to actually backfire for the IDF because Hamas is actually starting to regain some territory, regain some control in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. I'll say this also. In Israel, in Netanyahu's government, he is very much in a bind. His expanded government is made up of some very centrist elements, uh, Minister Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot, but the majority of his government is extreme right-wing elements, elements that have called upon Israel to expel 2 million Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, elements that have called upon Israel to occupy the Gaza Strip and reestablish settlements there. These things put Netanyahu in a direct collision with the United States on the one hand. On the other hand, his government is dependent on these people for survival, which is one of the reasons, I would argue, that he's being very vague. It's one of the reasons that he's not saying what is going to be the plan. Because if he comes out and says Israel is not going to have operational control of the Gaza Strip, there will be a Palestinian state. For example, what the United States wants Netanyahu to say, his government will fall. In turn, if he says what his government wants, Israel will have control over the Gaza Strip and there will be Israeli settlements there and Palestinians will not have a state. If he says that very, very bluntly, then he will be in a direct collision with the United States, who is quickly losing patience with his government. So that's one of the reasons that he's choosing his words carefully, saying Israel will have security control of the area not necessarily administer the civilians on the ground, but in fact, what is happening is while the fighting is going on, the lack of actually implementing something is starting to be costly. And in the IDF, we're starting to see frustration with the political establishment saying, okay, we are doing what you ordered us to do. What is your plan so that we don't just have to go back and send troops again into the areas that we already took over? That is still stuck. Before we continue on about what the future of this entire war holds, I want to keep talking about this lack of effective strategy, so to speak, and put up some video today, the families of still hundreds of hostages being held by Hamas. They held a rally in Tel Aviv, and they are continuously putting pressure on Israel to strike a new ceasefire deal to bring them home. Is there optimism that this could happen? If so, what would that look like? And furthermore, what lessons were learned in the first ceasefire deal that would be top of mind when brokering a new one? The first um, deal of a truce um, at the end of November, by Israeli standards, could be considered a great success. By Israeli standards, Israel released um, not a lot of Palestinian prisoners. Like in the past, for exchange, in exchange for one kidnapped Israeli soldier, Israel released over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. Here, Israel released three Palestinian prisoners for every hostage that was sent back. Most of the prisoners who were released were what's called not heavy prisoners. There were people who were in jail for a year. Most of them arrested actually since October 7th. As far as Israel is concerned, the price was a very low price. And the reason for that is that Hamas just needed a truce. It needed a truce and was willing to accept that low price. Hamas, since then, has made clear it is not going to do that again. Right now, it is putting a very, very high price on any negotiation or any ceasefire. Hamas is demanding a complete ceasefire and a complete Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. and. In recent days, it added another demand, guarantees that it will be able to maintain its control of the Gaza Strip in exchange for releasing hostages. So Hamas has really upped the price in that sense. 
those conditions, according to Israel, and specifically Prime Minister Netanyahu made a speech tonight, he said, I reject those conditions outright. Israel is not going to accept an ultimate ceasefire and a withdrawal. That is not a price that Israel is willing to pay. So right now, it seems like both sides have climbed very high, and there's nowhere to meet in the middle ground, on the one hand. On the other hand, there is intensifying pressure in Israel to actually come up with a deal. Hostages are clearly not being rescued. Only one hostage was rescued as a result of the military campaign. Otherwise, all the hostages that have been retrieved have been the dead bodies of hostages. Some of these actually killed by the IDF inadvertently as part of the fighting. So the military campaign that has, according to Israel, two goals, returning the hostages and destroying Hamas, is not managing to return the hostages through force. And that's why there's a lot more pressure in Israel to say, okay, that has failed. There are still 136 hostages, according to reports, a little over 100 are alive. And Israel needs to come up with a deal in order to re- return them in any reasonable manner. So the pressure is mounting. The United States, Qatar, and Egypt are all mounting extreme pressure on both sides, Israel and Hamas, to come to some sort of agreement. Today, it was reported that both sides have agreed to resume negotiations. Negotiations though, have been frozen for already two and a half weeks after the assassination of Salah al And even prior to that, they weren't really getting anywhere. So there is hope because political pressure in Israel may actually produce a hostage deal. However, the chances that Israel will agree to a complete ceasefire and withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, I don't think is realistic at all. That would be not only political suicide for Netanyahu, it would simply not coincide with the other aims of the war, which is destroying Hamas. So if, if Hamas stays with that condition, we're probably not going to see any sort of hostage exchange. Chances are, though, that Hamas is also going to back down from that as time goes on, because Hamas is going to need a truce. It is going to need time to regroup as Israel deepens its grip of Han Yunus and Rafah. So we may see something, but unfortunately, probably not for at least, I would gamble, two weeks plus. Okay, alone. finally here, let's talk about the mounting tensions in the Middle East. I'm going to pull up some video. Also, the explosion in Syria's capital of Damascus yesterday, killing several members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Iran and Syria both placing the blame on Israel, Israel not formally commenting. What are you expecting may happen in the next few days? So Israel in the last three weeks, I would say, has severely intensified its attacks in Lebanon and in Syria on, many, on several different levels. It has also intensified its attacks against Hezbollah, while at the beginning of the war, Israel was adopting a policy of what they called fire will be answered with fire. Hezbollah launches rockets, Israel retaliates. Hezbollah launches missiles, Israel retaliates. In the last several weeks, Israel has changed that equation. It is now initiating attacks against Hezbollah infrastructure, against Hezbollah launching sites, not waiting for Hezbollah fire. One. Two, these assassinations. We saw the assassinations in Syria of Gaza Musavi and other assassinations like yesterday that was attributed to Israel. Then we saw the assassinations in Lebanon. Salah al the leader of the Radwan force, and this other assassination yesterday, there was also an attempted assassination of one of the field commanders of Hezbollah today that failed, but his car was attacked with drones. Israel has taken the initiative. There's a couple of different reasons why this could happen. Some commentators who are very critical of Netanyahu are saying that Israel is trying to goad Hezbollah into launching a war so that the war will be prolonged. That's critics of Netanyahu who say the war won't be prolonged. Strategically, though, one of the things that seems to have happened is that Israel has realized it doesn't want to wait for a time that's convenient for Hezbollah. Instead, it wants to push Hezbollah into realizing Israel's prepared for war. It's pulled some of its troops out of Gaza. It, it can handle both fronts. And Hezbollah shouldn't, quote unquote, poke the bear. One of the things that's happening is there's a lot of diplomatic pressure on Lebanon. In Lebanon, there's big fears of a war with Israel. Lebanon cannot withstand the type of thing that's happening in the Gaza Strip. The economy in Lebanon has been crashing for years. Inflation there is over 90%. Hezbollah, for all its force, right now, it would be politically damaging for it to actually enter into war with Israel. And I think Israel is trying to take advantage of that. It's trying to say, okay, we have certain demands. Our demands are that Hezbollah be pulled up north, beyond the Litani River. Our demands are maybe that Hezbollah be dismantled of certain weaponry. Our demands are of an international force that will be in the border between Israel and Lebanon. These are all speculations from different leaks and different proposals that have come up. I think Israel is trying to say, we're ready to up the ante. So therefore, someone better listen. Someone better 
come up with a diplomatic solution because otherwise Israel started to up the ante more and more and more, showing it's willing. If Hezbollah wants to go, let's go, so to speak. So that's what I make of these different assassinations. I think it's really Israel sending signals to Hezbollah and to Iran. On the one hand, not all-out war. Israel has not carried out very high-profile assassinations of Hezbollah figures, which would drag Hezbollah into the war. It's done so against other organizations or field-level commanders, not the political establishment of Hezbollah, in order to say, we're not forcing you into the war. We're letting you know we're ready for the war. So come up with a diplomatic solution. Otherwise, we're ready to go. There was a report in the Washington Post yesterday that Israel informed the United States that the end of the month, the end of January, is the soft deadline, not hard deadline, but soft deadline that Israel is giving to come up with a diplomatic solution for the situation right now between Israel and Hezbollah. And if such a thing doesn't happen, Israel is going to start intensifying its attacks. I think Israel is signaling that it's serious about that threat. Alone, unfortunately, it does look like there's going to be so much more to talk about in the next few weeks as these tensions are going to continue to grow, at least given from what we've seen these past few days. Dr. Alone Verstein, visiting assistant professor at UC Irvine Israeli Institute fellow. We always appreciate your insight on this very complicated topic. We'll hope to speak to you soon.